Welcome to Amazing People. I'm here with Dr. Fareed Garagazlu. He is a professor of surgery at the University of Central Florida. He's the head surgeon at Florida Hospital Celebration. He graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School, was a fellow at Harvard Medical School, professor at Georgetown's Medical School, and the first surgeon in the world to be designated as a surgeon of excellence in robotic surgery. Since 2004 to this day, he has been on America's Top Doctors, America's Top Surgeon for Cardiothoracic Surgery, and America's Top Surgeon for Cancer. The accolades are fantastic, but to give a deeper picture, check out what a patient said about him. This is a, a letter that a patient wrote to him in 2016. Dr. Garagazlu, as we entered your office and saw all the awards and plaques on your walls for excellence in medicine, we did not realize the man we are about to meet. We not only want to praise you for your medical abilities, but we want to give you an award for the man that you are. Your compassion as a human being is beyond compare. Too often, we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, or the smallest act of caring, all of which can turn a life around. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done for us. It has been an honor to have you as our doctor, but more of an honor to know you as a human being. This is a truly amazing person, and we all have a lot to learn from someone so accomplished with so much integrity, wisdom, intelligence, work ethic, and care, who has lived a life in a truly noble profession, and who has sweat to educate himself to the highest level so that he can perform at the highest level at one of the most important jobs in the world. He now grants us his time to share what all has happened in his long and amazing career. This series is for college students who want to learn work habits, medical students who want to see what a doctor looks like at the peak of their career, professionals of any kind who want to see the living image of a consummate professional, and for any person who wants to know about the best that humanity has to offer. So, welcome on the show, Dr. Gargazlu. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. So let's, let's begin by talking about uh, what got you into medicine. Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting story, which I hope that will illustrate a little bit about um, my background and, and also my cultural background. I came from Iran originally to the United States at a very young age and, um, and really has been the guiding light for, for me for, for uh, virtually all my life. Um, to understand that, I, I have to take you back to uh, the 1950s and tell you a little bit about Iran and where I come from. In the 1950s, uh, I Iran, uh, which now by many people is understood to be a certain thing, whatever that is, in, that we see in the news, was very different. This was a country that was ruled by a king, an, an absolute power type king. and. Uh, and a lot of um, young men would go out of the country to learn, to go to school, and come back. One of those young men was my father. He came to America in the 50s. He trained in the United States to be a surgeon. And then he went back to surf, to serve his people and, and, uh, and to do what was sort of the, the, the guiding light of, of his whole existence. Um, it turned out that this young man was sent to a city by the name of Om. Now, many people know that city these days. That is the, Shi uh, the Shiite Islam's seat of power. Uh, this is a city about 100 miles south of Tehran, uh, a very, very conservative place where all the ayatollahs are trained. Uh, people go to that city to become Islamic clerics. The city has no movie theaters, it has nothing that is really different than it used to have in thousand years ago. This is a very conservative place. He was assigned to a new hospital that they had built for, to serve the people of the city and he became the director of that hospital in the late 50s. And, and he served them with honor and I am so proud of that because he was loved by this people. Now, you have to understand, 
he is the antithesis of everything that, uh, that would apply to that city. He was an educated, a Western person, a new, actually newly married, uh, brought his bride from, from the big city and so forth. And it's important to understand the, the background to understand what's going to happen. So he, was, he did well, everyone liked him, but what, the greatest honor for him that they could give was that he was the only physician who was allowed to treat the wives and the women, children, or the daughters of the Ayatollahs. The only one. Now, a few years later, um, 1963, uh, there is a man uh, who uh, comes into the political scene in Iran, and his name is Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, he became very famous many years later as the leader of the Islamic Revolution and so forth in the late 70s. But this was a young Ayatollah who had started to fight the regime in Tehran and the king. Mm -hmm. Well, um, th th it was, there was so much uh, political unrest in Iran that there was martial law, people were dying in the streets, soldiers, you can imagine a revolution starting. And, um, and I remember I was young, I was five years old, and. And uh, I remember it's just like yesterday that uh, the, uh, the Savak agents, these are the secret police of the Shah, showed up at our house uh, with guns and so forth. And, and it's just the most, most terrifying thing you can imagine. And their orders were that my father was to stay in his house and not leave. And the reason was that the daughter of the Ayatollah Khomeini was pregnant she was due, and the baby was breech. The baby was what? Breech, meaning the baby's head was not coming out of the uterus, but uh -huh. the feet. Uh -huh. That means that the uh, baby needed to be delivered by cesarean section, mm -hmm. and it needed a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, they forbid my dad from attending to this woman mm -hmm. because they wanted her and the baby to die. They, this was a this is a war going uh -huh. on. You see, uh -huh. and the, ayat, the the best way they could think of hurting the ayatollah was, or one of the ways was, this kind of uh, tragedy. Oh, oh yeah, you I see? understand. Yeah. Now, so so, you can imagine what goes through people's minds in those circumstances, and and, the thing that's amazing to me even to this day is here is this young surgeon, with his wife and his children at home. Uh, and the one thing he didn't do is follow their orders. Mm -hmm. he, he, I mean, at the risk of death for everything around him, he, w he went to the hospital, he delivered the baby, mother and daughter lived, and, uh, and he told everyone that before I'm a father, before I'm a, mo uh, a husband or a son, I am a doctor, I am a healer, and this is what I have to do, no matter what the price. That's amazing. That, I mean, I get goosebumps saying this so many years later, but that is my first interaction or my first recollection of what truly a physician should be. I'm proud of that. I don't think I'll ever be like that, as great as he was. But he did it at the risk of major personal uh, problems, mm -hmm. and and so that's really what what uh, has resonated with me all these years, and it's the it's the very much the guiding light for my whole career. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Uh, be, being that you've been practicing for so long, how do you look back on the many many patients you've treated, many patients who you may have uh, treated 25, 30 years ago may have passed away at this point. Where, how do you how do you look back now? Frankly, with a lot of humility, I tell you, the, the one thing that is important to understand is no matter what your intentions are, no matter what, where your heart is as a physician, it's a learning process. During the process, uh, patients um, suffer. Uh, you make mistakes, just part of being human. No one is born knowing everything. And, uh, and you just want to decrease the number of mistakes. You want to decrease the number of people who may... may uh, be hurt by that process, but really medicine is, is, is not a perfect science. 
And, and so I, when I look back, the, if I were ever to, to dedicate all these years of work to something or someone, it would be to my former patients. And not even the former patients who have done great and have lived, which would be the majority, but it's the former patients who didn't do well. Because each one taught me something new, each one taught me to be better, and to serve the next person in a better way. In fact, one of the reasons that I entered the world of robotic surgery is a patient. Now, unfortunately, I don't remember the patient's name, but I remember the patient. Um, and I think that's an important story too. It's, my life is, I think, can be illustrated with these little vignettes, but I think they mean a lot. And it's very important to, to look at these things. I was an intern uh, as a first year after medical school, young surgeon, just training at the, Ma at the Mayo Clinic. Now you have to understand the Mayo Clinic is, a, is the most amazing place on earth in terms of medicine. It is, there's no question that it is unrivaled in all of the world. Mayo Clinic located in, in Minnesota, Cl Rochester, okay. Minnesota. And um, in those days there were no other Mayo Clinics, now there are some branches. But really the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota is a very special place. And the reason it's a special place is that everyone is a master of the art. Everyone, so surgeons are master surgeons. These are people that when you watch them operate, when you learn from them, it's like watching an artist. Mm -hmm. they're, all, they're all driven for that perfection. And e in that environment of perfection, as a young surgeon, I remember we did an operation. Uh, I was involved, I should say, in the operation. I didn't do it, I was just there, in a person who had some lung surgery. And when they had their lung surgery, in those days, we had to open their chest, make an incision. And the surgery went great. The, there was a tumor, we removed it. Everything went beautifully. But a day later, the patient died. Mm -hmm. And when you look back, the patient did not die because of the surgery. They did not die because of mistakes. They died because of the way their body reacted to that incision. Now we have come a long way to understand the effect and the stress response and all the hormones and change and there's a lot of discussion there about what happens when you open the human body, mm -hmm. which really is not a natural thing. Mm -hmm. And that patient died as a result of the cascade of changes that occurred from the incision and not the operation. Mm -hmm. So it was that, that, that one example is how that person changed my life because from that moment on, the one thing that was important to me is I have to find a way to do surgery without opening the chest. Mm -hmm. Now today, it's second nature. This is 1983, we're talking many, many years ago, long before you were born. But the point is that in those days, that was the way it was done. And, and then each of those patients taught us that we need to do things differently. So the same operation now is done with three little holes with mm -hmm. all our technology. So we have come a long way. And that patient, whose name I don't remember, is the key to my career in robotic surgery. So there have been many like that. So uh, a lot of professionals, when they're caring for someone, have to be emotionally detached in order to make the best decisions. So uh, what about, uh, how do you handle uh, I'm sure there's some degree of emotional care you have for patients, right? How do, do you love them detachedly or do you care for them detachedly? How do you, what motivates you to work for them? Very good question. I think that um, it's important to understand as a, as a surgeon, people who come to see me do need caring and emotion, but they also they want expertise. Mm -hmm. They want someone who is driven, someone who is very particular, someone who will treat them like his own family, mm -hmm. and someone who is gonna do the job perfectly. <laughs> That's what they want. Yeah. If you don't do those and you just hug the patients, they don't care. Mm -hmm. 
I think the combination is important, but the first thing is as a surgeon, you have to deliver perfection. Uh -huh. And you have to demand perfection in every aspect of what happens. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that, but that is the key. The key is not what you see on, like in TV doctors. The key is, the thing that makes a difference in the life of a surgeon is when he understands that his personal fulfillment comes from perfection, uh -huh. the art, and the, the fact that everything has to be just so. Because when it's just so, everything else is easy. Mm -hmm. Patients do well, and of course you have to care for them. And you, But again, that is the ultimate caring. I think the perfection in a surgeon or a physician is the ultimate sign of caring for his patients. Okay, great. And so h how, did, how is it that you've found yourself at this position, being so decorated and awarded? How did you rise to the top of your field? Because I'm sure there are other doctors who've been in the industry as long as you have, who maybe they weren't as ambitious, or maybe they, for, for whatever reason, they're not where you are. And where you are is in an enviable spot. What, what advice would you have for anybody who would be a medical student or a professional of any kind to be where you are? Well, I appreciate you saying all these, and, and, I, and I, I, I think, you know, I can tell you that you'll be surprised if I tell you it's out of selfishness, but not because selfishness from ambition, not selfishness for things that you think are selfish, but it is selfishness in terms of of uh, self-respect and respect for the patients. Mm -hmm. What that means is I need to be proud of who I am. So that pride of perfection and striving for that perfection, which I haven't reached, but, but it's every day you keep striving. And it's sort of like everything else in life. I mean, I really believe this. Life is not supposed to be easy. Unfortunately, as humans, we want it to be. We think it. Yeah, our our sure. minds are designed to do things efficiently, which is good in one way, but makes but us lazy weakness. in another way. And that makes people always feel that they're losing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the other way yep. is to say that life is really a walk in a jungle. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get eaten, it's a good day. Uh huh. Right? And so, not to get eaten, you have to be thinking about what's going on around mm -hmm. you. And so in medicine, the, again, you, to, to be successful, you have to be a perfectionist and the fulfillment comes from the constant change and the constant improvement. And it's sort of like getting in shape, right? If you ever stop exercising, you're gonna go out of shape. Faster than, you, faster than it took you to get where you were. Exactly, so, so the key is you always have to work at it. Whether it is a marriage, whether it's a relationship with a family member or a son or a daughter or whatever, with a friend, whatever it is in life, I cannot think of a single example where you don't have to work at it. If you don't work at these things, you fail. And a career in medicine is the same thing. I think my colleagues who find themselves unfulfilled are the ones who forget why they became a physician in the first place. Uh huh. And you know, it's an interesting thing. I, it just, it just something came to my mind. We, in medicine or in a lot of things that we do, we we, we go through these these uh, steps on a ladder, mm -hmm. right? You go from high school to college to medical school to residency, on and on and on. Once you become a specialist, there's no more going up. So what <laughs> happens is, right? I mean, it's not like you keep going to school. So, so, so unfortunately, what people do then is they measure their success. Now again, it doesn't have to be medicine, it can be any field. They measure their success with financial success mm -hmm. at that point, and that's bad. Mm -hmm. That is a death sentence in my world. Money is not bad. What I'm saying is measuring your worth with money is bad. Mm -hmm. So in, in medicine, I think that one should continue to evolve, continue to grow. And the thing that keeps me alive 
is every day when I come to work, I'm looking for a new thing. And as soon as I know how to do something, I'm not interested in that anymore, and I move on. Uh -huh. That's academic medicine. Uh -huh. You see? Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, people think academic medicine is you're in the laboratory doing things and so forth. No. With Truly, a microscope. Yeah. It's, it's a series of observations, patients teaching you things, but keeping your mind in shape. Mm -hmm. Key. Yeah. So what personal habits have you exercised over decades to keep your body, mind in shape so you can perform at such a high level. And I will say, I know personally, I'm 25, and there are periods at which I've fallen out of shape physically. When I fell out of shape physically, my mind went with it. The whole being within me is, is connected. And when one thing is going wrong, other aspects go wrong. Fitness Absolutely. to me is of the utmost importance, as is good health in general, which is something you're helping people with by being Absolutely. a surgeon. Absolutely. So, for me, I exercise a lot, I stretch a lot, I eat the right foods, I sleep, I, I, I try to sleep eight hours a night, and I'm pretty successful at that. What about you? Well, ditto, really. The thing is, of course, I'm much older than you, but the point is that I have learned in life that sort of it's an up and down situation, and you will get to points where you may perhaps don't exercise enough, et cetera, et cetera. But the key is to understand that the human body is a machine that needs to work. It's like if you have the most beautiful car in the world and you put it in the garage, it's gonna die. Mm -hmm. It's gonna fall apart. It'll get dust, the oil might become thin and leak out. Leak out. Mm -hmm. the, and the, when you try to take it for a spin, you can't see because the windshield's covered with dust and the engine gives yeah. out. And, and all the, all the uh, uh, we are all perishable. See, this is the other important thing that we are made of perishable things, whether mm -hmm. it's an engine that has rubber gaskets that get old and crack and doesn't, the engine doesn't work, mm -hmm. our rubber gaskets get old and crack as well. Yeah. And so the point is you have to s keep this machine rolling, mm -hmm. working. Yeah. And so unfortunately, for some reason, as we get more sophisticated, we keep this machine working, but not the rest of it. Right. We're not forced to move. Yeah. yeah. But this machine is only part of the other machine. Mm -hmm. so, so it's important, I think, to exercise. It's important. Um, I mean, again, the, the, just for me, um, I, I don't, I've never like, ha had alcohol, not because of my culture, not because of religion, not because of anything, but because I didn't want to do it. Or I never smoked and so forth. And these are not really meant, I don't mean to say that things I do should be the way people should be, but at some point, people I think need to, or I came to a point where I said, these are the things I don't want to do. And this is what I have to do to be able to do what makes me happy, which is to be a good doctor, a good husband, a good father, and a good person. Those are all, if you're ailing, it's hard to give to people. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. I mean, that is really the sad thing that you see. And in our, my profession is high stress, long hours, lots of things. The key to this profession, and it sounds so simple, are really two things. One is you have to love your patients, not because it makes them feel good, which it does, but <laughs> because it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. It gives you a reason to do what you do. It doesn't matter if you do great surgery if you don't love the patient that you operate on. And then the second thing is you gotta love yourself. You gotta be able to be in a position where you can sit with someone and be credible. Mm -hmm. If I sit with someone and they, I talk to them about their health and I'm not healthy, it's not credible. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's the truth. Well, I, I play a lot of tennis uh, and I, I, I work on videos such as these. So these are my two joint passions, and the, the more I get into both of them, the more difficult it gets, the, higher, the harder I need to work in order to compete with other videos that are out there, other tennis players that are out there, and like you said, the world is a jungle. So I've found that I've had to undergo quite a bit of personal pain in order to work at 
levels higher than, than where I was before. Yes. So I find myself transforming personally through the process. So I'm a different person today than a year ago because of the pain undergone in these pursuits and the pain was justified because I really wanted it. I really wanted to do well in both of these things. Totally. And in order for me to evolve, there's been a definite pain component. Yes. It's a pain component of who I was uh, dying away and who I am uh, becoming born. Mm -hmm. So uh, have, have you felt that continual? I mean, is, is it more of a transformation uh, from three years ago to today versus when you're 25 to 28 or is the growth um, tapered or slowed down? No, it's, it's all under your control. I mean, of course, there are different things. I mean, there's, there's physical pain, and then there's the pain of, of doing various accomplishments. A tennis player has physical pain, but there's also mental pain, which is probably more important than the physical pain to overcome and to excel. The, so, so everything in life, frankly, should be painful. Mm -hmm. Any day you don't have pain, you're dying. I promise you. you know, I, I like these. I don't. I don't hear about this much. I like. I like hearing this. This is the truth. You know, in my view of the world, which is just my view, it doesn't mean it's ever, it should be other people's view. But the secret for my happiness is that I really, truly see a day without pain as a day when I am dying. Because mm -hmm. the ultimate point of not having pain is when you're dead. Right, that, that, is, that, is, that is true. <laughs> so, so that's, but, but you know, the, the, the humans are animals. Mm -hmm. Not in a bad way. I don't mean to be disrespectful to humans, but we are an animal. Mm -hmm. and, an, and you have to understand that. No matter how intelligent you are, no matter how many gadgets you come up with, no matter what you're doing, you're still an animal. That doesn't mean in a bad way. It means you have to understand who you are. Mm -hmm. and what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And we need constant growth. Mm -hmm. If you don't grow, it's like a business. If a business doesn't grow, it dies. Mm -hmm. it, it, if a body doesn't grow, it dies. If a well, mind, etc. What happens also when a business that stops growing dies is that all the people dependent on it, which is employees, children of the employees, other people in the supply chain, they get hurt too. Absolutely. As it relates with you, with, if, with your uh, doctor job, mm -hmm. you, if you fall off the wagon, patients, uh, there's going to be one less doctor, or one less good doctor for, to, to look after the patients. Well, I appreciate it. But yeah, I mean, I think that the issue really is that the, the norm for the human animal is to go to mediocrity. To go to based on pain. laziness, yeah, yeah, La less default default laziness, default and point pain avoidance. Absolutely. Yeah. So what you need to do is to fight that because that is really the survival of the fittest. That is the process that makes you a better organism, and that's what's happened all the years uh, that that we've been on this earth. We have evolved, mm -hmm. and and so in our own little ways, in our own little worlds, you have to evolve, mm -hmm. and and so. Um, and I mean this, it's, it's, it's my career in medicine has been rewarding partially because um, uh, not only do I hold these rules for me, but the rules are for everyone around me. So there is that, that, that excitement of the group also, all the people who work with me, whoever they are. Um, and, uh, and that's important because as a group, you say, Part of what we do in serving humanity is see what we have today and be different tomorrow, be better tomorrow, every day. Not just, see, I don't like the word practice of medicine. That's, that's just a bad term. It's really, medicine is, should not be a practice. It shouldn't be something you kind of learn how to do and you just keep doing it. Then you become a cobbler. You're just making another pair of shoes, mm -hmm. which is what happens to a lot of people, whatever area you're in, medicine or otherwise. And then you wonder why they're not fulfilled, and you wonder why they are slowly dying, because you cannot be a cobbler. You, even if you're making shoes, you should be making a new, different pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. How does one find those opportunities? I'm sure in medicine there's advancement in technology, then you need to learn how to use it. 
for one, right? Or maybe there are different variants of cancer that you don't know how to treat today that you might have to learn about tomorrow. Well, you gotta, again, work at it. It's just as simple as that. You always have to be aware of it. For example, um, my journey in different institutions in my 20 years as a surgeon has been defined by looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. Not financial, not egotistical, not all of those, but really an opportunity to learn, uh -huh. you know? I mean, when my team and I came to where we are now, we didn't come here because I got a higher salary or a bigger position or yeah. a better title. Yeah. We came here because we identified that there was an area in medicine that we could really impact mm -hmm. and the patient volume with that specific disease was the highest here. Mm -hmm. So now you, have on a, uh, you are on a mission, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. And this mission will end at some point when we get to the point where we learn about it. Then we will have another mission and we will pack up and we will go to the place where we're looking for the next, it's sort of like somebody looking for a gold mine. Once the gold mine has been mined, <laughs> you go for another gold mine. Mm -hmm. And then you're always happy, you're alive. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's interesting. I went to, uh, uh, I was in Washington for a number of years, and, and then we went to University of Arizona, across the country, for, and it was the, for th only three years. It was one of the best things we ever did uh -huh. because we went after that one gold mine. There happened that in that institution there was something to be done yeah. that we could do and we could get better at it and then, and then service comes with it, everything. So the key to this is, and I say this with the greatest love, for a physician, the patient is, the people you hear this all the time, patient comes first. Everyone says that. Uh -huh. Not true. And I say this with, with all the love in the world for my patients. The patient comes second. If you are not together as a surgeon, if you are not fulfilled as a person, if you're not perfect in, in your art, and you don't pay attention to what you're doing, your patient will not come in at all. Uh. <laughs> you see? So the best way to serve humanity and patients or whatever is to start with here and make this the best fighting machine, so to speak, as yeah. possible, you see? Yeah. And then it goes so that you can actually give to people. Otherwise, you're just taking. Yeah. I think also when, when somebody sees someone really impressive, they, they feel inspired. And, and that in itself can help change some gears in their mind and get them to start willing themselves to get into better health or yeah. uh, things like that. So that speaks to your point of self-care. I know I, I, I speak about fitness quite a bit, and I know that fitness models can be intimidating for people because they think, oh, I can't ever look like that. It, get, it stops them from trying. But at the same time, fitness models can inspire you of what a human body is capable of, of being. And, yes. and those people uh, more or less just took the right steps to get there. And, and yes. seeing it at its height can, can inspire you. And so yes. that speaks to your yes. point. And, and I would add, if, if you don't mind, uh, the other thing that in that fit mind and body and so forth, you have to add the concept of the, the guiding light, the calling. Now, different people have different things they do, but you all humans need to belong. They need to fight for something. Uh -huh. This is in our DNA. Yeah. And, and it keeps you, it gives your life meaning. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's just an existence, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and for me, and again, this is not like a session to talk about my dad, but I can tell you, you can tell that, that uh, he's always with me. My mm -hmm. dad's been gone for a while, and, uh, but he's always with me. And whenever I, I honestly, this, this is the true thing. Anytime I feel tired or I feel like, gee, I don't have any energy to go on, I think of him. My dad, after the Iranian Revolution, you know, he, he uh, was a physician for a long time. He was the dean of a medical school. He was very accomplished. After the Iranian Revolution, they came to America because we have had a lot of connections with America and mm -hmm. we're American. Mm -hmm. um, he was 66. 
66 years old. But he came to America, and of course, he had the financial means to sort of put his feet up and live the life of Riley, as they would say. That's a, and, uh, but he didn't. At the age of 66, he went to school to, to, to be able to take a test to get a license to practice medicine in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. When you're 25 and you have to take a test, it's hard. At 66, yeah. you see? That is being, not for, for the fact that he needed to do the work, not because, because it was his calling, mm -hmm. so that he could remain the person he was. Mm -hmm. And years later, at the age of 90, when he was dying, this is when we were in Washington, D.C., he had a massive heart attack. So they brought him to my hospital, to George Washington, and, and um, he didn't want anything done. He was a very strong man. He was like, I'm 90 years old, I'm fine. And the last day of his life, he spent with medical students, telling them about his life. Amazing telling them about why he had done what he did, being a physician, trying to get them to understand that this is not a job. It has become, we have made it a job in some ways, sometimes, and so forth. And, and it has nothing to do with what's going on med with medicine today. That's the fallacy of the whole thing. At different times, things happen. And so, if you want to make it a job, you could have made it in 1920 a job, you could have made it in 1950 a job, and you could make it now a job. But you don't make it a job. It, it's a calling. And, and it's that spirit that stays. And it's, that's what I see. And I think that that's my, th my guiding light, and everyone should have their guiding light. So that it gives them the energy, it's sort of like your, your whatever it is, your fountain of youth kind of thing, where you mm -hmm. get that energy and you go and you say, this is what should be done, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think that's what people need, for whatever they do, to feel successful and to feel fulfilled. Well, you definitely have a vibrancy and, and youthfulness in you, in the sense that you look elder and wise, but also you have a, you don't look as if you've been defeated by life or defeated Thank by... You. Uh, aging or uh, anything like that and that may have a lot to do with having that light continually guiding you particularly probably in your darkest moments when you're really stressed in the OR operating room or when absolutely. you're getting tired absolutely people need this I think and really if any any if there's a young colleague listening or anybody else and these are things by the way that I haven't come up with these are things I learned from others mm -hmm. And so I've had my mentors who have given that to me, mentors who have made it very clear. And, uh, and I think that that's really important for people to understand. And it's, it's the, 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 the position is difficult, the career is difficult, everything, no matter what you do, no matter what you do. But the key is how you look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've met uh, older doctors who are cranky. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing that, that's amazing to me, and, and I don't blame them, but I, I, I um, remember uh, surgeons change clothes in the locker room before they go to the operating room, and so many people, as they're changing their clothes into scrubs, they're talking about how they're dreading the, what's coming that day, yeah. and how life is so difficult. That's just self-defeating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's, and I think that it is, it is. Um, um, there's a story I think by uh, it's a, I think it's Chekhov. Um, there is a there is a short story by Chekhov uh, called the Wall. Mm -hmm. It's a story of two women in a hospital room. One is next to a window, the other is not. The one next to the window looks outside, and she keeps, and they're both bed bound, so they can't move. And she looks out the window and she sees meadows and children and flowers and birds, beautiful things. And she recounts all that to the other one. The other one gets envious. She can't come and see what's outside. She really wants that, you know? And, and she kills her 
the one patient kills the other patient so that she can get her bed next to that window to see the things that she's seeing. And when she looks out, it's just a wall. <laughs> so that is an important point. It's what's here. The it's point being that she saw the wall wherever she was. So the other woman saw the wall, but she made her mind oh, okay. kept her mm. going. Yeah. You yeah, see? Yeah. Because and I think it's very, very appropriate uh, discussion about life in general. Life in general is a wall. It's a wall. And, and what you can't see the wall. Mm -hmm. You've got to see past that wall. Yeah. And if you do that, no matter what you do, you're going to be successful. So you've treated hundreds or thousands of patients. And do these images of memories of these people come into you at random points of the day when you're driving, when you're eating? How do you feel about them? Well, um, honestly, uh, there are times that I do think about my patients. Obviously, the ones who are in the present are the ones I'm concerned about so that we get everything done. My, as I said before, my most important task is in the operating room. And that's an important issue which, which people don't pay attention to. That's my theater. That's my stage. So in the operating room, there, the operating room to me uh, is like a SEAL team going on a mission. Uh -huh. And the thing that blows my mind is to, um, to, to, to hear of people who have music in their operating rooms, who have different team members in the operating room. What do you mean? Meaning nurses who don't work with them usually. Uh, what this is there is a, common. Um, um, shadowing? Or is uh, no, that's not really, that's not, that's fine. It's okay. just that the usual thing you see is uh, 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 a surgeon doesn't work with the same group of people all the time. Uh -huh. And so, or et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of loose. Yeah. Uh, that is unacceptable to me. Yeah. And to be frank, the, the majority of medicine is like that. Is it because people are easily distracted? They don't keep yeah. the, right, uh, the, the, the right strictness in their work habits and things it's, like that? It's a culture. Medicine is a culture, and unfortunately, we don't really do a good job of teaching the culture. It's not like in the, in the Army where you before you are a member of the U.S. Army, you go to boot camp, uh -huh. where you learn well, they, they, the they culture. Kick, they kick all that. They kick all distractions and stuff out of you. Out of you, and, and you become through pain. Through pain. Absolutely. Talked about this earlier. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's an indoctrination into that culture. You yeah. see, medicine is not like that. And and the other thing is, people come into it from different angles. Not everybody goes through boot camp. You know, you may go to medical school, there are different kinds of medical schools, you may go to nursing school, you may go so, so this is a difficult thing and I'm, I don't pretend to have the answers, but in my world, I do have the answers and the answers are the strictest ways. If you can form that type of a tight group, mm -hmm. like a SEAL team, these mm -hmm. days they're like, you know, the, everyone talks about that. Yeah. Well, that's what's necessary. Yeah. So in the operating room, so getting back to that, if perfection is executed in that mission, you don't need to worry about what happens after the mission. Uh -huh. So in the present of uh -huh. my patients, frankly, I don't worry about my patients. And the reason I don't worry is not that I'm a god or anything, but I did everything that I could ever do for them. Uh -huh. No stone unturned. Yes. And we are not leaving that operating room until everything is perfect. Uh -huh. We will think about it, just like you're going on a mission to get some, I don't know, terrorist. You practice and practice and practice. So there's no, there are no words in, in our operating room, and this is my rule, no talking. Everybody knows this is not an orchestra. This is not where I, I'm the surgeon telling people, you go here, you go here, you're like conducting these people. Mm -mm. These are all professionals. They have drilled and drilled and drilled, and they know exactly where they got to go at what time. And then what happens is it's a ballet. In a ballet, everybody knows their place. You know, when the guy goes like this, the girl jumps in his arm. It's not like he's lifting here. 
Uh -huh. Same thing. And mm -hmm. so when it's a ballet, it's not only beautiful because it's so elegant, and the elegance of a ballet comes from the fact that when he's going up, she's going up, you mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. Same thing in an operating room, whether it's the anesthesiologist, whether it's the nurses, whether it's my assistants and everything. So the surgery is a ballet, and it's a ballet of, seriously, virtually no talking because everybody knows. You had your hand out, they know what's required to be in your hand, just like in a ballet, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens in that environment of, which is, which I tell them, I, am, I believe in God, I'm a religious person, but my greatest religion is in that operating room. That is my, if you want to call it your church, your mosque, your synagogue, whatever you want to call it. That is it, because there, there is somebody, a human being, who has all kinds of people outside waiting for them. There's a human being on that table. And if you're not constantly thinking about that human being, who is covered up, they don't look like a human being, right? I mean, they're covered with drapes, they look everything. Like you're just looking. Skin and organs. You're and looking at an organ. But they're not an organ. It's an organ in a human being. The minute you forget that, you fail. And so if you constantly keep that in mind, you will deliver perfection. And in the present, honestly, I don't worry. I don't worry about our patients. Because if we do our job in that operating room the way I'm talking about, everything else will be easy. Everything else will happen. And, the hu and a lot of complications and so forth and so on occur from the lack of that tightness in the operating room for a surgeon. So that's my present patients. Now, talking about patients of the past, um, I do <laughs> think of them a lot. Yeah, I did ask that question five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were asking different time times. So they're different. The patients of the past is, is important. And honestly, I, I remember every patient I have lost, mm -hmm. every single one. Yeah. And, and each one, I, it's amazing. Like if you're thinking about some, this, something, they come to your head. And you say, what happened? What could I do different? Again, I could, it's not like you do anything overtly. You know, you're doing your best. Think nature has its own way. But there, if you don't think of that, it's possible that you will miss something it, it, from the past that you could redo in the future. There may be an arrogance in, in, in people who don't do as well as you do who don't reflect on mistakes meticulously yes. and ensure that never happens again. Yes, but not as a, as a weight on your shoulders, as almost it's liberating. It's, it's sort of these people are following me all my life and they're helping me. They're like sitting on the shoulder and telling me how to be better. Uh -huh. That is beautiful because, you know, it's just, it, it, again, this, it's a fascinating thing. If you look at like some of the, some of the Sunday morning evangelical show, TV shows, mm -hmm. Uh, different people. The main message is a very important message. No matter what religion you're in or whatever you believe in, the message is that you matter. The message is that you have to don't worry about your troubles. Worry about the fact that you are a special creation and you can overcome these troubles. Uh -huh. If you come to the point of understanding that you have to overcome these problems. Uh -huh. No matter what you do. And it's the same thing. So if you think of a patient who, that you lost 20 years ago as an albatross around your neck, that's your loss. Yeah. S speaking of quiet and uh, teamwork and professionalism, I'm the biggest fan of Roger Federer, pro tennis player. He is uh, known uh, as contrasted to people like John McEnroe and even Andre Agassi from past decades who were more loud and boisterous. He has always been extremely silent, stoic, mm -hmm. and uh, he's played tennis at a level of beauty that no one has seen before. And that's part of the reason that he is so loved. It brings so Watching him play brings f things out of people. I got to see him play in Miami in 2017 against Nadal, 
in the final. And in the first five minutes, I started crying. Hmm. That, that, that there was something about the beauty that just shocked me. And it, he, he's doing what he's doing. He, he takes care of himself very well, like what you said. And beauty comes out from the silence, from the elegance. And uh, he's been compared to a ballerina. So I'm, I'm connecting dots here. Another thing, he says he has one of the largest teams of people supporting him. S stringers, coaches, his wife, business people, who, whoever's with him, mm -hmm. physical trainer. Uh, so his team is larger than that of other uh, pro players. And he joked that he needs to make the quarterfinals of a tournament to break even, right? So he's got the silence. He's got the, uh, he's got the great, solid team. And uh, he has the, the utmost professionalism. Although, of course, he'll go around joking when, when it's appropriate. He's, he's, very, he's very serious about what he does. And he, in an indirect way, changes lives. He yes. changes. He, he's, inspi he's been the single biggest inspiration for me. And uh, I've looked up to him as a man. I'm, I've, modeled, I've modeled myself after him. And uh, in, a, in a world where there's a lot of dark stuff, he's a, he's a fantastic beacon of light that has lit me up over and over and over. And speaking of success, longevity, all that, he's 36 and a half, and he's world number one. Wow. Which he's the oldest man to ever be world number one uh, at that age. And there's no close second right now. So, no, no, that's that's really. Uh, I mean, I, again, I totally love hearing this because it is, it, it is almost exclusive of the area that you're working in, whatever it is. Uh, those are the same rules, and the fascinating thing is to see the transformation. Jay, we have some young people who join our team, who come disorganized, distracted products of a different world and after a few weeks they become different people so you're saying that are you, is that to say that someone can transform in these ways if they just try they all <laughs> yeah. okay. so the door is never closed yeah they're never closed so yeah sp speaking of that uh, Federer used to be very very cantankerous and he would smash rackets he, had, he, had, he was a big emotional head case and at one point in his late teen years he just I mean, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't talk about what he went through, but he went from being like that to being what I described completely serious. And I think that had, he, had it not been for that, he, uh, he, he wouldn't have been nearly as successful as, as he has been. And, it, 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 and it's not just him that's riding on this, it's, it's me. I was inspired by him. Seriously, if he didn't get his act together, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had this person to, to look up to, someone to be my guiding light. So he saved a life. You see, you don't need to be a surgeon or a physician to save life. And, and the, po the, point, the point of everything that I'm doing, the reason I've got you here, we're talking about habits for success and all that, which are very important for practically anybody doing the best they can with their life. Uh, th the larger reason is that same inspiration that I want to spread to everybody, that they can look at Dr. Garagoslu as a light. Right? And, and for every person that I've brought on this show, you are the third guest. For my first guest, Anirudh, and my second guest, Garen, and for you and for whoever, whomever comes afterwards, that, that, is, that is key, who they are. Well, I, I am honored and delighted, and, and I think that um, in many ways it's a lot simpler than people may think. You just have to think about it, mm -hmm. just like everything else. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, Dr. Garagoslu, we you talked about how people aren't focused enough. They, they get distracted too easily by listening to music in the operating room and uh, things like that. And then we talked about quiet, how important that is to actual performance. Uh, let's talk about how to uh, institute those cultural changes so that not just on a one-by-one -one basis, but that uh, on the whole, that more people can adopt these principles so that they can perform better and do better for the people around them. Right, so right. Uh, no, good point, good I, question. Well. For the first thing I would say is doesn't come natural. So you really have to think about it uh, if you're going to do it. Uh, and is, uh, and if the natural sense of humanity is mediocrity. Right. I, I think you kind of, you default into mediocrity. Yes. Right? Because through laziness, habits, path of least, path of least resistance, and things yeah. like that. So for me, it's been interesting to look into the world of business. Yeah. 
they it's survival of the fittest in business for sure. There we that's go. The, that's the jungle. Yes, and, and, and there are a lot of lessons to learn in the world of business. And so you can take those lessons and apply them to you and your group around you and so forth. So if you, and, and, and it's a little easier actually because again, business can be measured easier, the metrics are easier, mm -hmm. everything is easier. Yeah. So if you look at um, business, and there's, there's so many, I mean, all you gotta do is sometime be stuck in an airport and you go to the, to the bookstore and there's all these Forbes and Fortune and, and you know. Yeah. There, there, um, there was a, a, a study done at Stanford back in the 90s. I don't know if you're familiar. It's called, it was by a guy named Collins. Uh -huh. he's, a, he's a professor at Stanford of, of, of uh, professor of economics. Mm -hmm. And they looked at 2,500 uh, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are 2,500, 500 of them are Fortune 500, the others are. So they're the biggest companies in the country. And yeah. they asked the question, uh, what can be different to make a business in this very, very special group of businesses even greater. Mm -hmm. And they set these parameters, <coughs> irrelevant what they were, but they were so difficult to reach. It had to do with stock prices, it had to do with performance, it had to do with all these things. And so they set the bar really, really high. And you have these 2,500 great American companies, only 11 met the bar. Which, if we want to go by percentages, is less than half of a percent there. But that's what we want. That's <coughs> what really, I think, that's what you need to strive for as humans. So taking it from business to you and me and my organization and so forth, we want to be that. We want to be one of those 11, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the beauty of this study was they retrospectively looked at these st companies and said, what was special about these companies? What was different? And again, in business, it's easy to measure, so you can say, well, look at these numbers. And, and to make a long story short, they came up with a series of things that they did, and it all have to do with culture. It has nothing to do with which business you're in. Mm -hmm. The first one was leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you, said, you have said that to me before when we've spoken, and, and I think you would agree. Mm -hmm. But the leadership that they found was that they, they defined five levels of leadership. And it ranged from the typical leader that you have like in a dictatorship where he just tells everybody what to do and all that, to the level five leader, who interestingly is a very unusual leader because that's a leader who gets his inspiration and his fulfillment from the success of the people under him. Mm -hmm. Not a leader who's like, leading you into battle, <laughs> standing behind. Not a leader who is a typical CEO of a company where if the company does better, financially he does better, ir irrespective of what happens to the workers, mm -hmm. but a leader who says, forget all these, the key thing to me is the fulfillment I get from the success of the people under me, because if those people are successful, I'm successful. L let me uh, interject. The previous guest on my show was Garen Sproul, and he runs a janitorial company. He, uh, he operates exactly like what you just said. And it, uh, yes, uh, yesterday or the day before, he was driving. Uh, he's pulled off on the side of the road, and somebody approached him and started talking about his life, himself, how hardworking he is, and things like that. They talked for, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 minutes. And... Uh, Garen really liked this guy and he wants to help him out. And Garen is in a position of leadership where he can provide jobs to people. Mm -hmm. He, and, and this situation, he just, he just attracts it through, his, through who he is. Mm -hmm. he, he was on the side of the road and this person approached him. It's very possible that if Garen were a different sort of person, this person would not have approached him. So when someone takes that mentality of being helping of the, the people that, that work under them, it ends, up it ends up ballooning, mushrooming so far beyond just an, an initial intention. You'll find pe opportunities arise. People will start rewarding you for that. People like me will start complimenting him for it and talking about it yes. in other avenues. Mm -hmm. And Garen, I believe there's a lot of really great stuff to happen for him 
and the people who work for him in, in the time to come because of how he functions. That's, that, that's fantastic because that's exactly what, what, what I'm talking about. And, and it's interesting when you do that, the, um, the fulfillment and the happiness you get is just, you just can't measure it. Mm -hmm. It is interesting that there are lots of people who talk about leadership. So for example, they, there would be a course and then they'll go get a CEO to bring him and talk about leadership. Mm -hmm. about our, or a course you get a general in the army to come and talk. That is not level five leadership. The mm -hmm. level five is what you're talking about. And that is, I think, this, the absolute secret uh, or the key to opening this, this, uh, this safe, so to speak. I love also that the leader who is truly doing the best thing by caring for the people for, uh, that work for him is the one who wins. I love that. Yes. I think that that is a universal principle that, 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 that is as it should be. It's positive every way around. And that leader needs to make sure that like you, like Federer, healthy, fit, ready to go, ready to do good, aware of their position, that it, 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 it serves them the best too, mm -hmm. right? They Absolutely. will make more money than the other ones because their company is doing better. And that, yes. that affects everyone on the supply chain. But the company, it's interesting, does better because each person then becomes a, a ballooning themselves, mm -hmm. you see? And it's, an, it's a fascinating thing. Humans need to feel that in some ways they're helping themselves. This is part of us too. So, but, so if you feel that you are helping yourself by helping the people next to you and under you, and it just propagates, it's, it's, it's an exponential growth as opposed to the other ways that go. So anyway, I think that's a fascinating thing. I would call level five leadership, level 5,000 leadership. No, seriously, like that's the difference in quality between level five leadership and level four leadership. Th th absolutely, you said it beautifully because really there's a big gap yeah. And, and, and uh, it, it's sort of like anything else in life. If you know the answer, it seems simple, mm -hmm. but most people don't know the answer to that. And again, you're not born knowing it. You need to study stuff and see examples, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's an important point, and, and it goes to, to your self-fulfillment mm -hmm. as well. Uh, because then everybody becomes a leader, mm -hmm. or you see, and then it just goes on. The, the other thing that it, it's interesting, there are a number of things, and but go down the list. The other thing they said, which is an amazing thing, uh, and it can be interpreted in different ways, is that any, anything you do in life should be seen as a bus ride. And the reason they use the bus analogy is that you know where you are and you know where you want to end up, mm -hmm. but the, the road in between is unknown. Mm -hmm. It could be the most circuitous road in the world mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah. It's okay. As long as you know you're going to go to that place. Mm -hmm. So in business, in <coughs> life, etc., that's an important thing. Because what happens is humans, the first time there's a curve, the first time the bus is not quite on the right track, they lose interest, they lose the uh, confidence, etc. So the key, the point of this bus is, don't with that kind of a leader, you say, you're on this bus, we're going to get there. It may take a very circuitous way. Don't lose sight of where we're going. Uh huh. Very important. He, that leader needs to have the long-term vision yes. to, to then withstand the many winds and curves that can would otherwise throw them off, and, def and definitely throw everyone else off. Absolutely. Now. I've given you a few, few stories. Let me tell you a, another story, which is, uh, this is amazing. Truly one of the most amazing stories I'll, I can tell you. When I was in Washington, when I first started, there was back, I think it was like 1999, there was a young woman who was fourth year college student who came to work in my office and to assist my secretary and assistant and you know do office work as, as work study. She graduated and she wanted to go to medical school. She graduated from college and didn't get into medical school. She then came and worked with us. This is 1999, 2000 range, 17 years ago. She worked in the office, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And 
she never gave up on the concept of becoming a physician, mm -hmm. going to medical school. She would take these MCATs and all these tests and not do so well. And all our hearts were just like pierced for her, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all crying inside. Yeah. <laughs> but a very talented young woman, a very smart young woman, a very capable young woman. She actually did a number of papers with me, published them, she gave talks, very capable. But for some reason, when it came to the, you know, this, these things that are kind of, I, I see them as artificial. You know, whether you do a well on an MCAT is artificial, it means very little. Whether you get good grades, bad grades is somewhat artificial. They're, anyway. they're, they're simply broad standards which don't necessarily speak to the, the, the capability of a person. Exactly, and it's, it's the bell curve, and there are people who are on either end of that bell curve. And it's the believing in yourself that's important. About a week ago, I learned that she was starting medical school. 17 years later, uh -huh. she never gave up the dream. Her bus took very, very circuitous road but that's an important point. So l let's get into the thinking of somebody else who would have been on the same path, say around 2003, 2004. I'm sure uh, she had people telling her, it's not right for you. You, d you didn't score well on the MCAT. Y you should probably take another path, maybe be an ARNP, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, be, a ner maybe be something else. Yeah. You like caring for people, right? Maybe you could do th you know, work in the medical field, work for somebody or something like that. Right. And it, it, it's, I'm sure people told her that. Absolutely. It's on her to then figure out what to listen to. Because at the end of the day, it's voices in your head. Yes. And then it becomes your willingness to figure out which voices you listen to. Well, I think that the number one to thousand should be what's in your head. And unfortunately, uh, we tend to put a lot more weight on others. Everyone means well. No one, I really don't believe that people are telling others to do bad things. It's just that you just don't understand. And I think that it's that self-confidence in this woman. I am so proud of her because I can tell you what you said is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. It was, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. What's, and it can be benign to the most malignant things that people would say to her. Yeah. But the point Good is, terms. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, 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 and then most people lose sight. But, you know, it's interesting. How many people do you know who changed their dreams because they couldn't reach them in the first get-go, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and that's the lesson. Now, I, I, I commend her, mm -hmm. and I'm sure she's, now that she's worked so hard for it, this is going to be a very, very special career yeah. because this means a lot. Yeah and uh, so forth, but so I think that knowing yourself is important mm -hmm. and knowing that you just can't give up if you really, really are gonna be ha unhappy if you did. And that's the key. So she was on this bus and she went down. Now, there's another point to the bus, which is important can, can in this I, can discussion. Can I say something? Sure. To anyone who's watching, uh, I urge you to think about what what that is for you, what that dream is as it was for this woman he's talking about that you really can't give up on. Because I know everyone has them. Everyone has them. And uh, what is it that you, that might take you 17 years to get to? Just think about that and remember this story. Yeah, so I, I, I second that and I echo that. So the other aspect of this bus analogy that's important, and that's really key, is, and it follows in what we just said, is that they found that the best organizations and companies know who should sit in which seat on mm -hmm. the bus. Mm -hmm. So what that says is you have to have that intellectual honesty with yourself. And to know if you should be in that spot. Exactly. Okay. So there are a lot of people in the wrong seat. Mm -hmm. And they stay in that wrong seat and then the bus many times doesn't reach its destination because they're in the wrong seat. Uh -huh. And so we talked about the young lady who got her dream fulfilled, but sometimes what you think is a dream is really not a dream. Okay. So you should have the ability or the in honesty with yourself to say, maybe I thought this is what I wanted to do, but this is really not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. 
and so few people do that. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really important. And, and, and uh, I tell you, uh, personally, I was really excited when I was in medical school about pediatric heart surgery. Okay. Congenital surgery on the babies. Right? Okay. It's exciting. Believe me, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's the anatomy is complicated. Everything is exciting about it. And uh, I trained 11 years to get to that point, to become a pediatric heart surgeon. Uh -huh. As soon as I became a pediatric heart surgeon, when I started doing it, I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. And I tell you, it is hard to, to say, it's a very difficult thing to <coughs> say, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. I, luckily, my specialty is such that you could pick different things to it. So you could do regular heart surgery, you could do thoracic surgery, you could do pediatric, so forth, because you're all trained in the whole thing. So the key is, at some point, you have to make a tough decision like that. Mm -hmm. And you can't let the inertia just take you. Because when you're into it 10, 15 years later and you say, I really don't like what I'm doing, mm -hmm. that would be a shame. Wait, so how did you get out of pediatric heart surgery? So, so um, I decided to do thoracic surgery. Uh -huh. And I decided to do robotic surgery. Now, I was lucky that I had my training allowed me to do any of these things. But my, ho my thoughts for all the years where I'm going to be operating on little babies. And mm -hmm. then I found out, you know, operating on little babies was not for me. Yeah. And, and that is, I think, what I'm talking about as intellectual honesty. So I was in the wrong seat. Yeah. And so as an organization now, the leader has to have the ability and the trust and the love of the people on that bus to say, Jake, wrong seat for you. You'd be much better in this seat and mm -hmm. so forth. That's an what if I'm like, no, I want to be here. This is where I'm supposed to be. Then you don't belong in the organization. That is a mm. very, very, that's because that was the next thing. That a good leader, again, who establishes his bona fides by the fact that he is caring and he's a level five and it's about the organization, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. that ha has the, that the trust of the people has to be able to say, you don't belong on this bus. Uh huh. Because so many buses have people who don't belong. They need to be on another bus. Th there are a lot of ways, there are many more ways things can go wrong than it takes for them to go right. Yes. So know who should be on the bus, who should get off the bus, and which seat they should sit in. That's how the bus goes to the, to the destination. I think in terms of instilling a, a culture also where uh, th that can take the bus in the right direction, the leader it's most preferable if the leader leads by example and lives that way. Yes. So for example, let's say you're the leader of this surgery organization that you have, yes. which is accurate. Yes. By seeing you work with, it. as a matter of fact, there's a, paint, there's a letter on this wall right, right behind where Dr. G is sitting, which says that I've never seen someone perform in the theater the way you do. That person has now felt it themselves. They've felt how good that is. They've seen the results. They've seen the person behind it. And they are more likely to be doing, doing it now after having seen it. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and I tell you, it is, it is a, what I said earlier about child, operating on children versus adults and that stuff. Um, that was one of the toughest decisions I have made in my life. And it's, a, it, it's not just a decision. It's like everybody around you expects you to do certain things. And for you to come out and say, what you think is not me, it's a tough thing. There are people who do that, you know? I mean, I can imagine there are people who, uh, who have lived a certain way in their life and quote unquote come out to their friends and so forth. That happens in all different parts of life. That is courage. That is courage. And that's an important thing, to be able to have that kind of courage and honesty with yourself, whatever you do, whether it's a social issue, whether it's work and so forth. And I think that that is the greatest way to have credibility. What? That, that, that showing that courage to the people around you. The courage to say this, this when, it, it would in, when it involves you, to say, I'm wrong or this is not the way, et cetera, et cetera. So it can take, manifest in many ways like that. 
So people don't want a leader who is not fallible. They don't want a leader who is always right. They want a leader who cares about the enterprise enough to put himself second to the enterprise and the people in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's true leadership. And I think that's, that's an important point. So, so you know, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. I actually do that um, to my fellows. Um, uh, in, I've been involved in teaching others to become surgeons all my career. And there have been people who were my favorite people. I tell you, I mean, I can think of two people af after 20 years, two people who I really liked, and they were capable, and they were intelligent, and they were so forth. But they weren't meant to do what they were, they were thinking they should do. Mm -hmm. And those were the most difficult <coughs> and painful conversations I could ever have. Mm -hmm. But that's leadership. That's because I am saving you when I tell you, you shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. You see? And, and, and mo that's like getting involved. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's say, they say that like if there's a tragedy happening or there is whatever is going on, the bystanders are even guiltier than the person who is doing the tragedy mm -hmm. or committing the crime. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So you can't be a bystander in, in, in life, in organizations, etc. You have to get involved, you have to take the pain, and you have to make the tough decisions. And when you do that, things go well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of winding paths and, uh, and finding your actual place, you wanted to do pediatric surgery for uh, 11 years. The skill set you built there, while not specific to thoracic surgery, still helped you get into thoracic surgery. Yeah. Similarly for me, I've had a winding path. I, I went to, uh, I, I studied business when I was in college and I, I trained as an actor for a year and a half, two years until the signs hit me that that wasn't right for me and I'm doing what I'm doing now. And through acting, I learned about, through business I've learned about content about what we're talking about. Through acting I've learned about pe characters, mm -hmm. characters in a story mm -hmm. and, and inner psychology, inner motives and I've learned a lot of empathy for people of whoever they are. And because sometimes you need to play those people, people who are not like you. Right. And through learning that, I've, the empathy has helped and I understand the, the structure of psychology better than I would have otherwise. And that's helping me get a deeper degree of understanding when I talk to you, when I talk to anybody about what their motives are, how we can make the world a better place and things like that. I, I love hearing that and I, and I uh, basically I would say I, I think that that's a beautiful thing because too often in our world we have these, these cookie cutter paths. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and then you wonder why so many people are not happy. Yeah. Yeah. And they're very, they're not multi-dimensional. Mm -hmm. unidimensional yeah and and so if if someone is interested in going to medicine I would say to them do not see college as a stepping stone uh -huh. make it a teaching moment make it a period where you expand your mind and and uh, and it's not like I did that so I'm going to tell you this is not because I did it do it the way I did do it because the way I didn't do uh -huh. So the point is, people should should learn in in college. If someone's going to medicine, they should learn the humanities. They should learn history. They should learn about life because you're going to be dealing with people and their of, lives of all cultures, of all lives. You have to understand. Excuse me, people. You have to just like in acting, you get to know, get into the minds of different characters. So and then. The, everything you learn is, is, is like, like little building blocks to get you to where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. So don't see this as go from A to, to B and that's it. Uh, it's, it's interesting. When I was, a, was looking for residencies, mm -hmm. I walked into the room of this guy who was a pediatric surgeon, one of my mentor, you know, by the name of Dr. Haller. And... Uh, 
and I said, Dr. Haller, you know, I, I just can't believe it. I, this one place is, it takes seven years to become a surgeon, and this other one is five. I'm going to go with the one that's five, you know, because I just I can't wait to get into the game, so yeah. to speak. And he said, you see my door? True story. See my door? Walk out of that door and don't come back uh -huh. because you don't deserve my advice because you are faint of heart. Exactly. And that was his way of saying, it, don't worry about that. You are a physician. And then when he got the chance to talk to me after he set me straight, mm -hmm. he's like, you're going to become a physician. Whether it's 15 years or 20 years, you're, you are building on, on this. You are becoming a better person, a better surgeon, a better server to the people that you're going to serve. So the point is, don't be looking at this like some sort of a race that you got to finish. And, and I think that that's important. So in life, all of these little things should be things not seen as losses, but they should be seen as ways of getting ready for the big game. So let's talk about that as, as relates to me. I, okay, let's talk about that as relates to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's easier. Okay. <laughs> I'll start over. So let's talk about how that's applied in your life and career. What are some losses in terms of uh, patience or mistakes that you've made that have built you up stronger, things that would seem horrible on the surface, but that, that have made you as you sit today in the big game? Well, um, I think that um, the, the, in my life, the, the, one of the most important lessons has been to, um, to see ad adversity as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a mindset. I tell you, and I think that that's an important issue. So I came to America. You know, one day I said, I'm going to go to America to become a doctor. And um, I came here with no money mm -hmm. on purpose because it was like, I don't want family to pay for this. This is my decision. I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. I came, just go to college. And uh, it was not easy. You know, I, 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 I I actually applied to go to Johns Hopkins. I didn't even know where Johns Hopkins was. Yeah. I was in Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, so, so it's not like it was planned. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, somebody said to me that, oh, if you want to be a doctor, go to Johns Hopkins. Because mm -hmm. that's a good place, right? So I applied. Do you believe, and I'm embarrassed to say it, I didn't even know that there was a difference between going to college and medical school. Mm -hmm. So I applied to college because I just finished you know, high school. And I, when I get in, I said, boy, it's so easy to get a Johns Hopkins. Uh -huh. <laughs> because in Iran, it was a six-year program. You get into the medical school at six years, you're finished. So here I come. Everybody is expecting that I'm going to Johns Hopkins Medical School. I show up in Baltimore, and it's like, this is not the medical school. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, this is almost uh, laughable, but it's true. So. That can be quite an adverse situation. Uh -huh. It can be, yeah, let the air out of your balloon a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'm in America. I can do it. You don't have money. The beauty of this country is, and I truly am proud to be an American, because in this country, you can do anything. And it's not just a saying. It's not a logo. It's not a bumper sticker. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. You can do anything. Yeah. And so America paid for my college. America paid for my medical school. America took care of me. And it wasn't easy, but it happened. And it's the conviction. So I would say in my life, the one thing that's important is conviction. And it goes hand in hand with persistence. Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. When I started college, I, it's like yesterday, everybody and their mother is taking a course in chemistry because uh -huh. everybody is kind of is pre-med right? right right so there's this you, you, same thing seen, today you've yeah. seen yeah large Huge classes. Room. <laughs> yeah yeah there's a guy the chemistry you can't even see him because he's all the way there and you're up the top of the lecture hall he is uh, uh, he his name was dr grider he was the pre-med advisor 
So he was more than just a chemistry teacher. So he comes, and this is Hopkins, and frankly, everybody is, is a good student mm -hmm. and so forth. And he's <coughs> first day, he's writing stuff on the board, if you could see it, and he's telling you what he's writing. Mm -hmm. So he writes. Did you take binoculars? Th no, you just, oh, you know, this okay. is the 70s <laughs> binoculars. No, you just sort of hope that you, you know. It wasn't that big. I mean, Hopkins, the class isn't that large. There's like 500 people in the class. And he says, there are like 500 of you in this class. Mm -hmm. At look the to end your of left, look to your right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's classic. Yeah. And then he wrote that many of you want to go to Johns Hopkins Medical School. Of the 500, only four will make it statistically. Yeah. Right? Another one of those less than one percenters right there. And, and it's like, oh my God, right? Everybody's starting to have a heart attack. And... And so th these things will happen all the time. Whoever is watching us, this is going to happen. It's going to happen all your life. The key is who cares. The key is you have to believe you're going to be one of those four. Uh -huh. End of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's going to happen. <clears throat> and it's not just a pep talk. That is the truth. You say, I'm going to be one of those four. I'm going to do it honorably. I'm not going to do it in any circuitous crazy way but I'm gonna do it and if you're persistent you will do it if somebody asks like you know there's a I saw a movie recently about Croc the guy who started McDonald's okay what made him do what he did he took a he in, in his time it was you could take a course by listening to records mm -hmm. I forgot who's who's was talking mm -hmm. what it was persistence so at the end of his life, when they said, what made you uh, probably one of the richest people in the world and have the largest uh, the landholder in America, believe it or not, which mm -hmm. is what McDonald's is, mm -hmm. yeah? persistence. Uh -huh. So persistence is important. Those who give up, they won't do well. And, and so that's it. And, as, and again, the only thing is you have to believe in yourself. And too many people look outside mm -hmm. as opposed to inside. Yeah, like it's that person's fault and it's, I can't believe there's only four people that are gonna make the cut. Yeah, exactly. That's what that outside professor said. Exactly. Without, without accounting for the fact that I will make sure that it is me and, and do everything I can. It, it, that takes a lot of work though. It goes very against the, the base human nature, which is to fall into mediocrity. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that having these huge pursuits and ideals and goals is the thing that elevates someone's character. I really think so. Yes. But because it also because makes them happy. It makes them happy. That, and the two go hand in hand. Yeah. Because you, there's, without a, a real cause to resist laziness and bad habits and things like that, without a real love-based reason or a guiding light, as you've said earlier, you're not going to do it. No. You're not going to. And I, I think one of the big problems today, I mean, I don't know if this is a today problem, but it's an always has been problem, is that people don't have a, a, a source of inspiration. I will repeat again, that's why I've got you on the show today. Well, and Garen, Sprav, and Arudar Vindran, and whoever comes later. I'd love to get Federer on the show. Yeah. Because he, he's, he's, he's done this, he's, he's been that for me, and I want to talk about specifically th these specific things as it relates to him so we can talk about it. Instead of him just being quiet on court, I want him to talk about why being quiet on court is important. And I'm sure, really, if you speak to a whole bunch of different people who've gone through this journey in different ways, there will be some common things. And those are the things that everyone has to take away and make it their own. And that's beautiful. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. I tell you, it's, a, it's, a, it's exciting. I mean, life is not easy, but it's a, it's a becomes a lot easier when you when you believe in yourself and you believe in your mission and you believe in what you're doing. That's it. So, so let's say there's a college uh, a pre med student or a medical student who knows that there are very few people who are going to advance to the next level. They want to make sure they're one of them, and there are uh, drugs around that help them focus for longer and things like that. There's the there's the obvious temptation to do that mm -hmm. so that they can stay up, focus, whatever, mm -hmm. outperform other people. Uh, in sports, the, the temptation is the same, but those sports are policed, so mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really happen. 
not much at least. In colleges and medical schools, I don't think that's the case. So how would you advise someone who's in that position? I would actually say the, the starting point is to look at the prize. Don't worry about all of those things. Just look at it. Okay, let's say you are a, a Russian athlete mm -hmm. who doped mm -hmm. to get a little piece of metal around your neck. Mm -hmm. Does it mean anything? No, mm -hmm. it doesn't. And you know, it's sort of like if you, this is also human nature. If you steal a pen, a pen, that's 10 cents. And if you steal it, the thought that you have stolen it ruins everything for you. Yeah. Right? So well, when you're in that mindset though, you might just want to steal more though. You may. Right. But, but you're already off the right track, so. But you need to think about it. You know, you need to think about it. You say, gee, why am I picking this up? Is, it, is this piece of plastic worth my self-respect? Mm -hmm. Is this thing around my neck worth the possibility of, one, ruining my body, but secondly, the shame, and so forth? In school, the same thing. If you want to be a slave to the system, Go ahead. Being a slave to the system means you are going to artificially change your life so you can get an A. Who cares? See, this is what I mean. But they do so, care because they want to get into, they're, they're in debt. Th they, they are wrong. And that's the point because they will never be happy. And I'm not, I'm not preaching. I can tell you, I know it from personal experience. I know it. The key is the mindset. You need to say, who is setting these rules? Who? Why am I supposed to do X, Y, and Z? Why am I supposed to, let's say, why am I supposed to go to medical school in four years? Why don't I take my time? What, if my brain doesn't have the ability to take all this in and perform in the way that society has sort of set up in an artificial way, I am going to do it in a different way, just like the young lady we it's spoke about. It's taking power back. Yes. Is what you're saying. Yes. I wasn't expecting that. Yes. <laughs> Take power yeah. back. Yeah. You know, what it do, you're giving an undue, undue power to the system of, you know, being in debt, fear that you won't be one of the people who makes it and, and all that. And, and, and not being able to withstand the, the training properly and naturally means that when you're in the profession, you're going to have a much, much harder time. And once someone in that position could actually look at it instead as an opportunity, not just to take more time and relax a little bit, but to develop their, their character, develop their concentration abilities, spend time staring at trees and, and oranges, just Absolutely. to develop concentration, work out more, mm -hmm. just like, like fit physically to, to develop more stamina and endurance, then come back next month or next year and see if they can handle the, the pressure more uh, in, in, yeah. the, in the natural way. Absolutely, because all of these mm -hmm. things are artificial ways of getting to a place where you really shouldn't be, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you need to take something to concentrate more, your brain is not ready yet for whatever it is that comes next. But they can develop it. They can develop it. How? I, I, mentioned, I mentioned something, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think that, that the, the first thing I would say is you have to be understand yourself and understand that things can take different amounts of time in different biologic systems. I mean, that's really the truth. And, 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 uh, when, and, and at some point, all of a sudden it clicks. And you've got to give your body and your mind a chance. You can't get distracted by these things. And, and that's really, again, it's... You can't be the slave to a set of rules that were made artificially for the bell curve. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> if you can get an A easily, go for it. It's great. But don't, if you can't, don't think you can't get it. It just may take you longer. Mm -hmm. You know, my career, actually, and then the other thing is don't be afraid of fighting City Hall, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of fighting what is supposed to be the norm, uh -huh. what is the accepted. Uh -huh. That is a death sentence. Okay. If you do sort of conform mm -hmm. without thinking. Be it doesn't mean you should be a revolutionary. Yeah. It means you should be a free thinker. What's an example? So, 
So many examples. My whole career actually is full of these examples. One and of you're the, at the top. Well, I, I appreciate it, but I think that, that it's interesting how everything is connected. But let me just tell you uh, one story that's not my career, but it involves my career in a different way. So I was a medical student. I took a year off to work with a great person who, whose lab was like the top lab at Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. working on what was causing ulcers in the stomach. Okay. Right. I, I, I never thought about that myself. No, no, no I mean, that, yeah, yeah. But, but this is an example of, you know, and this is just every time I think of this, it gives me energy. So, uh -huh. so, so, I am, so I am honored to work in this elite lab. I remember, I remember the lab was all decorated with pictures of the lining of the stomach and all this stuff that was happening because we thought at that time that the reason people got stomach ulcers was that they got acid somehow trickling down between the layers of the stomach burning the inside right mm -hmm. and I got an NIH grant I was like at the top of my game here I'm a medical student NIH grant with this guy I'm like man this is the greatest so we write all these a year we wrote I think 12 papers mm -hmm. which is an amazing accomplishment mm -hmm. And it was all about how somehow the lining of the stomach changed for different reasons and acid kind of got away to so like water going in your roof kind of thing and it impregnated the stomach and they got ulcers. And we published these papers and everyone's like, yes, great job, right? Same time, there are two guys in Perth, Australia. Nobody even knows where that is. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just uh, telling you. Australia. Like, yeah. In Australia, <laughs> in the 1980s, you know, if someone said, oh, yeah. And, and I only say this in retrospect. At the time, I didn't even know these people existed. But there are these two guys, uh, and as a pathologist and a gastroenterologist, who are making observations about the same things as we're seeing at the great Johns Hopkins. And they're like, we don't think acid is the cause. So they... Their observations don't quite go along with that. Uh -huh. We are the city hall, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So my papers, frankly, getting papers published has a lot to do with the mindset of the reviewers and the editors, right? So our papers are getting in the like this. You mean you're thinking about what the reviewers and editors might want, and then slightly catering? What no, 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 no. There is a publication bias because when I send a paper that's talking about how acid is causing these ulcers, and you believe that, mm -hmm. you're like, we got to publish this. This is great information. Yeah. You see? So there's Public that bias yeah. of the editor and the reviewer, right? Uh -huh. These guys in Australia are sending pa papers saying, we don't think it's acid. They can't even get their papers pub looked at. Mm -hmm. They finally, after 10 years, true story, 10 years, they get one little paper in the Australian Medical Journal, which is at the time was read only by whoever was in Australia. Nobody cared, right? They also were almost banned from medicine. This is amazing. This is a lesson for everyone who's listening. They almost were not allowed. I mean, they were like persona non grata uh -huh. in medicine, mm -hmm. these guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Finally, people start saying, hmm, maybe the emperor doesn't have any clothes on after all. Uh -huh. Maybe it's not acid. Mm -hmm. One of these guys takes the liquid from the stomach of a patient and inoculates his own stomach to prove that it's not acid. Okay. <laughs> and guess what? They write a paper saying it's an infection. Uh huh. And oh, so he he drank it to and, to, and they did not get an ulcer because yes. that's how sure he was that there we it go. was safe. Okay, yes. I I thought it was so, the opposite. So, okay. so 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 the bottom line of the story is that after all these years of just being banished, <laughs> people start saying maybe those two guys are right yeah. because they're persistent, and they're like. This is what I see. I don't know what you're talking about, but this is what my eyes see. Yeah. They publish it, and they got the Nobel Prize in 2005. Oh, wow. Wow. And you know what you can <laughs> do with the papers I got published? Um, uh, they're probably yellow and, uh, you know. <laughs> and 
throw yeah. those 12 papers in the garbage because they mean nothing. Yeah. That's, th that's an important lesson. Mm -hmm. That just because, and in medicine, it is more so than any other field. What we, we just are vehicles of information from the past. Uh -huh. But what we see and what we do can change that whole information. Uh -huh. That is the, that is how medicine grows yeah. and how we do, this is the science of medicine. So it is important to believe in your eyes and your mind and what you believe and you see and not discount it because the masses are saying something else. Mm -hmm. So that's an important, and honestly, in my career, that lesson, which was a negative lesson, yeah, you know, I'm the first one applauding when they got the Nobel Prize because yeah. it was like unbelievable. Right. And to this day, that is the reminder to continue on questioning, not in a bad way, but in an investigator's eye kind mm -hmm. of way, questioning the dictum, the mm -hmm. rules. Yeah. Okay. That's important. Yeah.